Okay, hello, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Understanding and Responding to Coercive Control. My name's Carly Hansen, and I'm one of the Sector Sustainability Coordinators here at Community Legal Centres Queensland. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're holding today's webinar. We're in Mianjin, Brisbane, and the traditional owners here are the Turrbal and the Yagara peoples. I wish to pay my deep respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge that these are stolen lands and that sovereignty was never ceded. As today's webinar is being viewed by people throughout Queensland and um, potentially some across Australia, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners throughout the country and extend a very warm welcome to any First Nations people who are listening in today. So we're really pleased to welcome Julie Sarkozy, Practice Director and Law Reform and Education and Counselling Notes Protect Lawyer at the Women's Legal Service Queensland, who will be talking to us today about uh, coercive control. In particular, uh, Julie is going to take us through the Women's Legal Service uh, Queensland and North Queensland Women's Legal Service uh, Research and Evaluation Project that was funded through the Legal Assistance Services Program. The project provides some guidance for community legal centres who are working with people who might experience coercive control in domestic and family violence matters. And uh, Julie will take us through how you can identify coercive control and provide some options for responding, um, particularly to women and others being misidentified as aggressors. Um, and this hopefully will aim to assist CLCs to better understand and respond to matters involving coercive control. Um, I will hand over to Julie in a moment and she can tell you a little bit more about herself. But firstly, I'll just do some quick housekeeping. So today's webinar is being recorded and I'll have that recording available for you to download this afternoon. The PowerPoints and a couple of other um, helpful flyers and posters have been um, uploaded to our website and the link emailed out to everyone who registered about an hour ago. So you can download those from the website and you can also grab the PowerPoints from the handout section on the GoToWebinar control panel. So we're going to have questions at the end of the session and um, I'd encourage you to type your questions into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel um, as you think of them and I'll read those out for Julie at the end. Um, so for now though, I will hand over to Julie and she can take you through this session. I'll come back to you at the end. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Carly. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Julie Sarkozy. I'm a Practice Director for Law Reform and Education here at the Women's Legal Service. Um, hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoints uh, that I've put together. So as Carly um, mentioned, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am today, which are the Yugara and Turrbal people, paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging, um, and also to any participants who are from our First Nations peoples, I'd like to acknowledge your involvement and being here today. Um, the next thing I want to say is, is that I'd like to make a trigger warning. I will be talking about domestic uh, abuse. I'll be talking about some of the things that uh, can occur in a relationship that has domestic abuse in it. Um, so I just really encourage everybody to look after yourself, talk to someone, talk to someone you trust, call a helpline if you're triggered. Obviously, do the things that you do to make yourself feel safe. The next thing that I wanted to address um, to begin with is, is that I am going to be using gendered language. I'm going to say when I refer to victim survivors, I'm going to call them women. And when I refer to perpetrators, I'm going to refer uh, call them men. And the reason why is because domestic and family violence is gendered. Most victim survivors are women um, and they're much more likely than men to experience harms associated with domestic and family violence, such as homelessness, injury, death, um, and also men are more likely to be perpetrate, perpetrators than women. Um, and I've just indicated there where the statistics come from for me to say that, but I have quoted the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, a paper um, that was published in 2020, 
called Accurately Identifying the Person Most in Need of Protection in Domestic and Family Violence Law, Key Findings and Future Directions. So if anybody wants to look at that, that's the citation for that. What I'd like to do is cover a couple of things in our um, presentation today. Firstly, I'd like to talk a little bit about our existing responses to domestic violence. You can see I've got a, a typo there. Um, what was happening? What were we missing? Tell you a little bit about the research project, what we learned, and then provide you with some resources, some fact sheet and a sample um, poster. All right, so all of you may be familiar with the Domestic and Family Violence Protection Act. In Queensland, um, Section 8 of that Act gives us a definition of what do domestic violence means. And it basically says it's behaviour by a person towards another that is physically or sexually abusive or is emotionally or psychologically abusive or is economically abusive or threatening or coercive or in any way controls or dominates the second person and causes the second person to fear for the second person's safety or well-being or that of someone else. So when you look at that definition, there's a couple of things that comes out really clearly to me, which is the word coercive is in there, in any other way controls or dominates is in there and causes fear is in there. If we look at our evidence-based risk um, indicators, then, and this is based on, you know, really well-researched risk in, in indicators for um, intimate partner homicide, uh, one is highly controlling and obsessive jealousy. Uh, another one is escalation of behaviour. Another one is victim's assessment, high levels of fear and extreme denial and, and, and minimisation. We've got separation. Uh, so, so then when you think about our own domestic violence definition has the words coercive, controlling, dominating, fear, we've got our evidence-based high-risk indicators that actually do capture that sort of behaviour, highly controlling, obsessive, jealous, the victim has high levels of fear, then how come, and, and in 2016, 2017, the Queensland Domestic and Family Violence Death Review Advisory Board identified coercive controlling behaviour as being present in almost all cases of intimate partner homicide. And from 2008 to 2016, the New South Wales Review of Domestic Violence Homicides found coercive controlling behaviours were evident in 111 out of 112 cases. So why is it then that Queensland police, lawyers and survivors themselves are not identifying as experiencing coercive control and that is certainly not coming up as being something that police are taking out domestic violence orders in relation to and lawyers are helping people take out domestic violence orders for and survivors themselves identifying that, oh my goodness, this is happening to me, I'm experiencing abuse. So within the, within the context of providing our own domestic and family violence specialist services, Women's Legal Service Queensland and the um, North Queensland Women's Legal Service were identifying that there were multiple experiences that victim survivors were describing that were actually not being identified as domestic violence by police, by us, by lawyers, and by the survivors themselves. We were noticing that they were identifying experience being frightened, being isolated, losing independence and self-confidence. And we were also noticing that other jurisdictions were identifying course of conduct or ongoing behaviour that had the impact of isolating, causing fear and undermining a person's sense of autonomy. And that in some jurisdiction, that course of conduct, that ongoing behaviour was actually being criminalised. So, 
For example, in Scotland, 2018, we've got a criminal offence that actually is engaging in a course of abusive behaviour. And what it is, it is engages in a course of uh, behaviour which is abusive of A's partner or X partner. And its relevant effects are making B dependent on or subordinate to A, isolating B from friends, relatives or other sources of support, controlling, regulating or monitoring B's day-to-day -day activities, depriving B of or restricting B's freedom of action, frightening, humiliating, degrading or punishing B. So it's a course of behaviour that results, the relevant event, effects of which are this. So very, very important. That's already a criminal offence in Scotland and has been since 2018. In Tasmania, we have another criminal offence. It's called emotional abuse or intimidation. And again, it's a course of conduct. A person must not pursue a course of conduct um, that has the effect or is likely to have the effect of controlling, intimidating, causing mental harm, apprehension or fear. And it includes limiting the freedom of movement and threats of intimidation. So we can see other jurisdictions already coming to terms with Yes, it's coercive. Yes, it's controlling, but it's a course of conduct. It's actually, um, it's actually behaviours over time. And we think, or we thought, maybe that's what's being failed to be captured here in Queensland. Because even though we have coercive behaviour, controlling behaviour in our existing definition of domestic violence, we don't have even our own kind of um, our own attention being drawn to looking at this as a course of conduct or as a as a whole you know uh, as a whole atmosphere in a relationship so what we've discovered is coercive control is not simply an action within a list of other actions that can constitute domestic and family violence but it's the context in which domestic and family violence occurs in more recent years the idea, the idea of coercive control has helped to more clearly communicate the perpetration of domestic and family violence as a pattern of harmful behaviour. Now, this is very important, aimed at controlling or regulating a partner's life, restricting their freedom and their autonomy. And this, this idea of a pattern of behaviour with the aim of regulating someone else's life, restricting their freedom, undermining their autonomy, is sort of first identified identified by Evan Stark in 2007. It causes serious harm to women and their children and is has been identified as a high risk factor for intimate partner homicide. I'm going to sort of talk about a lot of different definitions just because I want people to really get their head around what coercive control is. It's a course of conduct aimed at dominating and controlling another. It can actually happen by family members, extended family members, usually an int intimate partner and is almost exclusively perpetrated by men against women. This is from research done by Anne Rose in 2021 defining and responding to coercive control. I've added that in the PowerPoint so that people can actually look this up and look at these papers themselves. Um, sorry, I don't know where that, ah. So most people here, I think, would have heard of the task force. Uh, so the Women's Safety and Justice Task Force headed up by Margaret McMurdo. Um, I just want to, just to sort of mix things up a bit in terms of this presentation, play you the following. I've learned that coercive control is a pattern of deliberate and rational behaviour 
designed by one person to control another person within a personal relationship. This is done by causing the victim to fear for their or someone else's safety. The misconception that only physical violence is... Okay. Oh, oops, God, sorry. I don't know what's happened. Um, oops. Julie, if you just want to go back to your slide. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, the, the even Margaret Murdo has come out of this most recent Women's and Safety Task Force and has said, we now understand more about this thing called coercive control. And because we understand it more, we are now thinking of criminalising it. And their most recent uh, report, which is called Hear Her Voice, actually makes a recommendation that Queensland move forward to criminalise coercive control. So in the background of all of that, Women's Legal Service and the North Queensland Women's Legal Service wanted to understand better the prevalence of coercive control to our clients, that you, to the women who use our service. So what we did was we actually had a, we, we um, began a research project. And the first aim of that research project was to understand the prevalence. We used a whole mixture of methods. Literature review was done by a UQ pro, pro bono service, data collection by the two women's legal services, we did 18 interviews with subject matter experts. We had 15 interviews with survivors of coercive control. And it was actually guided by a group of experts in domestic and family violence. Our second aim was to learn from the women with lived experience of coercive control about what legal centres can do to safely elicit full disclosure and understanding of their circumstances and to provide support and also what might be the implications for community legal centres demand and practice. So the prevalence and how it could be identified. Well, in August 2021, 51% of women identified experiencing coercive control from the Women's Legal Service Queensland and 38% from North Queensland Women's Legal Service. We think or we believe this is a significant underestimation. And the reason why we think that is because 98% co-occurrence of coercive, coercive control with physical and sexual violence was reported by clients contacting DV Connect in 2020-2021 as part of their crisis intervention. So we can't explain why our own statistic didn't actually reflect that 98%, but what we can say is, is that it is partially probably because women themselves or survivors themselves are not actually identifying as experiencing coercive control. And the actual literature review that we did discovered some very interesting facts. Survivors told us of constant abuse, belittling, degradation. So these are the ones who actually said, yes, we've, been, we've experienced coercive control gaslighting, threats, sleep deprivation, monitoring, stalking, technological abuse and surveillance, jealousy and accusations of cheating, isolating them from their friends, family and community, financial abuse, um, sexual coercion and restriction to the access to the tools of independence such as finance, car, pursuing studies or phone. So things like withholding car keys is a, it was actually quite common. They also talked about um, escalation over time. So those behaviours might have begun quite um, almost innocuously. So the constant text messaging, where are you, what are you doing, escalate into 70 text mess messages a day co-occurrence of physical and sexual violence, abuse being perpetrated primarily by an intimate partner. That was uh, in 14 out of the 15 case studies that we had. Um, involvement of perpetrators extended family. Behaviours described by several women as legal systems abuse. 
so one of the quotes from one, from one of our clients was, so I tried to leave and here I am now, the one that the court says is the perpetrator and him using the courts to keep me under his power. So as I said, in the literature review, there was actually no definitive evidence regarding the benefits of universal screening of domestic and family violence in a healthcare setting. So we're not able to recommend from our research project that there should be universal screening or data collection tools. However, insights from the UK and the Safe Lives program developed to assist police when that new criminalisation of coercive control was happening showed us that when we as service providers are actually trying to assist our clients to identify coercive control, it is more important to ask questions about the impact of controlling behaviours rather than asking them to describe specific perpetrator behaviours. And we note that the literature shows that coercive controlling behaviours tend to be bespoke or specific to that particular relationship. So actually asking general questions about this is what coercive controlling is and so is this a feature in your relationship may not work. It is more useful to talk about the impacts or ask questions about the impact. For example, the Safe Lives program provided to police actually provides a range of questions and the police are asked to ask one or two pro forma questions that they feel comfortable asking and use it as an opportunity for incidental screening in the police context. And here's a sample of some of those questions. For example, asking someone, what's the first thing you think about when you get up in the morning? Can you describe to me what a typical day looks like for you? Can you tell me what things your husband, wife or partner expects you to do? Are there things that your husband, wife, partner makes you do that you don't want to do? How scared do you feel? What are the things that you do to keep yourself safe? How often do you get a chance to see your family and friends? Who decides what gets done in this family? How about, how does your husband, wife or partner react if you disagree with them? Now, these are not all of the questions. These are actually just some of the questions. But you can see immediately that these questions are actually not asking people to describe behaviour. They're asking people to describe impacts of that behaviour. A really good one is things like, what sort of things do you do to prepare yourself or the house for him returning from work? And the answers that you get to that question will almost always give you some idea of whether that person, the client, is experiencing coercive control. All right, it's a very, a very clear finding from the research done by our report is, is that women talk about feeling high levels of shame and embarrassment about what is happening in their intimate relationships so when coercive control is occurring. So they're embarrassed, they're so embarrassed that if you say to them, are you experiencing domestic violence? They're very unlikely to say, yes, I am. He texts, he texts me to check up where I am 70 times a day. So what they identified as being very valuable was doing things like planting the seed. So what they thought was valuable was providing information and perspective about coercive control so that the client could go away and think about whether or not that applies to them and then think about safely doing something about safely leaving or, or getting help. So what they found was really valuable was not so much workers saying, oh, you're experiencing domestic violence and I can help you take out a DV order, but planting the seed that this behaviour is not okay. So 
the possible impact on work for us was things like this, using a scene setting script along the following lines. Sometimes as people start going through the legal process, they sort of begin to realise that behaviour or expectations of their partner actually wasn't okay. Our clients who have experienced this have told us that it's helped to talk to us, to the solicitors about this because sometimes we can actually tailor legal responses that may change to improve your safety, right? So a bit of a sometimes when you start talking about this to people, you might think actually some of the things that happened in my relationship weren't okay. And then and then asking those questions which focus on the impact that the person experiences at home. And then if a disclosure is made, maybe providing warm referral to support services and actually alerting a lawyer, especially if this information has come from a support, support staff. And if the client does not make a disclosure, giving them a checklist or some other perhaps fact sheet that talks about coercive controlling behaviour, along with details of support to plant the seed in circumstances where someone may be experiencing abuse but can't yet recognise it or talk about it. Now, obviously, we need to be really sure that we, if we're giving somebody anything to take away, that it is safe for them to do it. So for example, that they have a safe place to leave information about getting support from, say for example, a community legal centre. So you would say, now listen, if I give you this, is there somewhere you can keep this that is not accessed by your partner? Is there perhaps a friend you could give this to? Um, keeping in mind that surveillance is a really key and common feature of coercive controlling behaviour. So what we, what we want to do is plant the seed, help women to identify if they're experiencing domestic violence, provide realistic advice about challenges and, in, and also provide realistic advice about the intersection of domestic violence orders, family court, provide frank advice incrementally to avoid women from leaving, um, from being deterred about leaving an abusive relationship. Coordinated and ongoing support to navigate multiple legal matters, recognising long-term harm and exhaustion of being subject to coercive control and the victim-reliant nature of the justice system. We really identified the value of duty lawyers. So this was actually a very strong recommendation that came out of our research, was women saying the duty lawyer coming and finding us and talking to us um, and actually acting on behalf of us and talking about coercive control-like behaviour and the impact of coercive control had enormous value. And then recognising us as sector workers, recognising the significant risk factor and how debilitating the harm and exhaustion that coercive controlling causes. And then also for us to equip bystanders, allies, families and friends to ensure that non-legal services support women and also can identify coercive control as a domestic violence, as the context of domestic violence and as a feature of domestic violence. So when we're talking about planting the seed, some of the clients talked about the value of actually having material in, the, in your foyer, uh, in your waiting room, that talks about coercive control. And one of the things that, that I found that for, was developed by the Scottish, by, by, this, by a Scottish service um, called uh, um, In Plain Sight or something like that, what it was made by Scottish Women's Aid was something like this. So this could be played in your lounge or your foyer, something like this. This is the Scottish one though. From the outside, you look like the perfect couple. 
teach the knight to know pleasure. Inside, I think Neko was teaching. He told me who I'm allowed to talk to and who I'm not allowed to talk to. And then he acted like it was all just a joke. Was it? He's deadly serious. He gets the kids to tell him who I see and where I go. He complains that I don't call him enough. Then that I call him too much. He gets into my email and deletes things. And he sends messages from my account. Useless mother. You get everything wrong. He told me if I ever try to leave him, I'll cancel your visa. You have nowhere to go. You bring shame and dishonor on the family. You'll never see the kids. Again, I'm trapped. What have I done wrong? Coercive control is against the law. It's a pattern of behavior that's not obvious at first, but does real damage, and it's a crime. Oops. Sorry. So, um, hopefully, I can get this. Oh, sorry. Now. Um, so as you can see, um, that's just one example, that if we, were, we have screens in our, like I know that down here at Women's Equal Service we've got a lounge, we could be playing something like this, which means that our clients would see this and they might actually see, oh, that's actually how I feel, that's happening to me. Maybe I'll actually say something about that to the lawyer when I speak to them. Or maybe that will just be something that they can go home and they can start think about, thinking about. The next resource was something that was developed by the James Cook University for um, trainee dentists. And what they have is they have this poster in the waiting room of the dentistry. And I, I've not put this in the, um, in the PowerPoint, but basically on the side it's got you know, yes, and it says, if you tick yes to some of these, then you may be experiencing abuse. You may be being abused. Um, and then it gives uh, gives the list of 1-800-RESPECT, EV Connect and Regional Domestic Violence Services. And these are some of the questions. Um, are you made to feel uncomfortable or afraid? Are you put down, humiliated or made to feel worthless? See, these are impacts. Are you prevented from continuing or starting study or from going to work? Has someone constantly checked up on what you're doing or where you're going? So do they constantly check up on you, where, where you're going, what you're doing? Uh, do they try to stop you from seeing your own family? Are you made to feel afraid to disagree or do you feel afraid to disagree or to say no to them? Are you constantly being accused of flirting with others when it isn't true? Are you told how household finances should be spent? Or stop? Or do they stop you from um, having any money for yourself? Are you made to use all your money for household and joint spending and they don't share their money? Are you stopped from having medical assistance? Uh, do they try to control you by telling you that you could be deported because of your immigration status? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, it may indicate that you've been abused and contact these services. So again, this is something that in our research, what we discovered was having these kinds of, this kind of material or posters in the foyer um, was actually really helpful as planting the seed for our clients to go back and actually put some of this behaviour, some of the impacts of the behaviour into context. So because this was the outcome of the research, what Women's Legal Service did with the North Queensland Women's Legal Service was actually develop this fact sheet, which is actually being provided to you all um, as part of this seminar. And it, it looks like this, and we thought maybe people could have this 
to give to people or to have in their um, in their foyers or in their lobbies? Do you worry your partner will react? This is Jane. Jane often feels stressed and tired, even exhausted. She's always on edge. She worries a lot. She spends most of her energy making sure her partner is always happy. She spends a lot of time fixing the little things that might annoy her partner. He is nice to other people, but not at home. That's very, very important. This is a very common feature of the, uh, the way that um, perpetrators present, particularly when they are behaving in ways that can be described as coercive and controlling. They are nice to other people. They present well when the police turn up. Sometimes she's scared that he will break something or hurt her, the kids or the dog. Jane is scared because she doesn't know when he will get angry or what he will do. The impact of feeling like you're working, walking on eggshells is a very, very common description. Jane thinks that it's her fault that he gets angry. He may not, but um, maybe he would be happy if she got things right. She doesn't want to be hard on him. He might be sick or perhaps he might have had a hard day at work. She feels ashamed and does not want to talk about it to anyone. And this was actually very, very strong. This, this sense of shame, not wanting to talk about it to anyone, feeling like it's your fault, came up very strongly in our research, which is why when we asked our clients what helped, what, what, you know, what's the feedback that you would give us, it was feedback about planting the seed so that they knew and that they could identify it as being part of domestic violence. This is coercive control. It is domestic violence. It's a pattern of behaviour that aims to dominate or control another person. We recommend that one of the ways that you could approach working with women experiencing um, coercive control is the care model. So planting the right seed, providing options, encouragement and support rather than fixing, respecting a woman's level of readiness and the complexity of the situation. Very, very important. When they're ready, action and advocacy, doing more than just listening. Without this, women reported feeling abandoned, recognition and understanding, feeling heard and validated, not rushed or dismissed. This may include naming women's experiences as abuse and then emotional connection, recognising the importance of emotional support, kindness, care, having patience with women and providing continuity of care where possible. And that's sometimes very difficult, depending on your resources. The other thing that we wanted to do was actually provide a fact sheet for service providers. And so as you can see, this fact sheet, regrettably, we couldn't actually bring it down to one page. So it's actually a double page. Um, so it's one double page and then a bit on another page. But again, this resource has been provided to all the people who've registered. And it has this information in it. What is coercive control? It is a course of conduct aimed at dominating and controlling another. What is important to understand, it's really common. It's not widely recognised in the community as, as a form of domestic violence. And it's not easy for victims themselves to articulate what's happening. It's much easier for victims and even us to say, oh, wow, he hit me, he hurt me, um, he's threatened me. Uh, but, but coercive control is a course of conduct that's aimed at dominating and controlling. Nevertheless, it is a risk factor for homicide and it can, it's, it's a significant cause of harm even after separation. At the moment, we don't have it enshrined in Queensland law as a single um, offence, even though there's some, it comes pretty close in the Family Law Act, okay? other behaviour by a person that coerces, of, um, coerces and controls. Having said that, I've seen the report, the McMurdo report, and it recommends that Queensland introduce a, a criminal offence of coercive control 
by 2023. And when it does, you can expect it to have something like course of conduct dominate or controlling another person. And we'll update this when we actually have a criminal law offence. Who perpetrate it? perpetrates it? Usually an intimate partner. And especially in First Nations and culturally and linguistically um, diverse communities, it might be from family members or extended family members. It develops over time, um, gradually controlling behaviours which increase in severity and frequency. Um, it may include physical violence, but not always. And I think that is actually one of the reasons why the police are not picking it up, we're not picking it up, and even survivors themselves aren't picking it up. And here's a not uh, an exhaustive list, but remember, usually coercive controlling behaviour is bespoke or unique to that particular relationship. So just because it's not covered here doesn't mean it's not happening. But as I said, you know, threats, belittling, humiliating, um, monitoring, stalking, sleep deprivation is a really common one. Jealousy, accusations of cheating. I'm sorry. Um, oh, sorry. A really important one is threat of suicide or, or self-harm. That's actually, in, from my point of view, very, very common. Restrictions and rigid rules about where the victim can eat or sleep. Um, where uh, threats or warnings about cancelling spouse visa or deportation. Um, you bring in shame on the family, I'm going to tell your parents. That's also quite common as well. The next page of this handout says, how does the victim feel? And remember how we talked about asking questions that actually talk about the impact and the constant pressure walking on eggshells, worried, on high alert, anxious, nervous. This, if you ask questions that actually elicit this, this is much more effective than saying, does he, does he stalk you? Does he um, check your phone all the time? Okay, this is much, much more effective because this is what's in common. Do you feel nervous? Do you feel exhausted? Do you blame yourself? Do you make excuses for him? What can you do? Be aware that victims may not have words to easily articulate what's happening. Treat the victim with kindness and without judgment. Provide concise targeted resources to plant the seed, to help them identify that they may be experiencing coercive control and take care not to overwhelm them. Don't rush them. Ask them questions about the impact. So here in our resource we've gone, we've given you some sample questions. Can you tell me about what a typical day looks like for you? What does he expect you to do? What are the things that you do to keep yourself safe? How, does they, how do they react if you disagree with them? Are there things that happen at home that scare you? How is this relationship different from other relationships? Are there things that your partner does that makes you do that you don't want to do? Identify for your clients that what they are experiencing is coercive control and actually is domestic violence. Um, now, uh, here we've got undertaking a risk assessment. Now, remember that there is no, at this stage, really compelling evidence that risk assessments should be done universally to our clients, but I think if a client is open to it, if they are saying, yes, this is happening to me, yes, I do want this information, I think it is actually important to provide safety planning, refer them to their local DV service and help them to coordinate supports for them. So make fewer and targeted referrals and make sure that the referral is to a quality service. They don't have a lot of energy to go shopping, okay? And help your clients, provide information for your clients about collecting evidence and how to do that safely. For example, don't, send, don't, don't put it in your drawer if you know that the perpetrator checks your drawer or checks your house. At court, duty lawyers should proactively make themselves known at court 
and be able to provide referrals. Um, Prioritise assistance for people who've been misidentified as respondents. Victims that are misidentified are already under enormous stress and they are vulnerable to consenting to orders being made against them to finalise the pressure of the court case. But this makes them even more vulnerable to coercive control. Remember how I talked about systems abuse? Legal systems abuse happens frequently uh, and one of the ways that it happens is orders being taken out against the person most in need of protection. What are legal remedies? Domestic violence protection orders, a, an application can be made by police or the victim. Uh, the application is available as a PDF or online. Controlling behaviours are not the types that are, that are not listed in section eight. Um, if they're not listed in that section, they may be hard for a victim to complete the application using online. It might be better if they actually complete it on a PDF. And try to get your clients to focus on behaviour that forced them to do something, where behaviour that controlled or dominated them, causing them to fear for their safety or wellbeing. Because if you do that, that sort of falls more neatly into our existing definitions. That is, of course, until we get the actual criminal offence. Try to focus on providing information about what the victim was forced to do, what the victim was forced not to do, and how the victim felt forced, and why they felt forced. All right, um, and in the family court, family law court, you could seek an injunct injunction. Well, that's the end of my part of this seminar. Um, so the next part is questions. I don't know if anybody's got any questions, so I'll hand it over to you, Carly. Thanks, Julie. Um, so just a reminder, you can ask your questions by typing those into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, there have been a couple that have come through um, at the time of registration. So. I might just go through those while we're waiting for some uh, live questions to come through. So firstly, um, how can the family court support vulnerable women who aren't able to keep evidence around uh, coercive control? Okay, so one of the things that I think is important, if, if a client says this is happening, then I think doing things like sending that information to an email address that might be a friend's email address. Um, so you can actually, so your client can access that information and then they delete it on their email, but that, that information is somewhere off site. I think that's one way. Um, and keeping contemporaneous notes. I mean, we always say as lawyers, try to keep a contemporaneous note, but we, we've got to be careful that that contemporaneous note's not, not found. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you can do is actually encourage your client to have a PO box. And so they actually keep all of their documents in the PO box. So things like bank statements, their own um, passports. What we do here at Women's Legal Services, we actually refer clients to, to social workers to develop safety plans. And so part of the safety plan is doing things like that, creating your own bank account, getting documents that you need, and actually having them off-site so they can't be taken and they can't be spent. Hope that that, that helps. Great. Um, so another question that's come through is whether you think that the criminalisation of coercive control could make it harder for women to obtain protection? Uh, look, I don't, I don't know whether it could make it harder. Um, I think what the research shows us is that coercive control as a criminal offence can have some unintended consequences for our clients. And that is in particularly, particularly where we have, still have a, a practice where um, we think women are being misidentified as perpetrators. So if you think about that, that's happening now. 
And then if you turn that, the potential of being misidentified into also being charged with coercive control, then that's very, very concerning. But what, we what we've found in jurisdictions where criminalisation of coercive control has actually worked, right, has actually worked, um, it's when police have had, you know, a good year worth of training before the actual legislation has come into force. So what, what does that tell us? It tells us that where the community, where lawyers, where police, where um, judicial officers have had training uh, when it comes to what is coercive control, what do we need to look for, then that means that those inadvertent, um, you know, bad outcomes are less likely to occur. So I hope I've answered that question. Carly, can you just repeat the question? Do I think it's going to have bad outcomes? Is that? Yeah, so let me just go back to it. Um, yep. Yeah, so do you think it, uh, that criminalisation could make it harder for women to obtain protection? Well, I, I mean, it's it's not meant to. And I think if it actually get what I think the value of it is more, more than anything else, is that it's starting a dialogue in the community and also, um, you know, uh, in the community, with the judiciary, with lawyers, even today, we're talking about what's coercive control? What does it look like? What does it feel like? I think actually increasing people's awareness about it should make it easier, not, 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 not harder. Great, thank you. Um, you spoke about training of magistrates and judges and there's a question that's come through um, asking uh, whether you know whether uh, magistrates and judges are on, on board with training in this area and whether they are undertaking this kind of training. Yes, um, so that's actually one of the recommendations from the um, Hear Her hear her Voice um, report. So there are, I think there are about like 82 recommendations, 79 of those actually are to the Queensland Government and the Queensland Police. And then there are about three that are for the legal profession and the judiciary. So three or four. Um, and so far what we've got is, and you know, I'm part of that process or the Women's Legal Service is part of that process, which is to try and develop training for lawyers, for barristers, and also for the judiciary in terms of what is coercive control, what does it look like, how do we know it's happening, um, stuff about misidentification of uh, who the person most in need of protection is. That is now very much centre of what we are talking about at the moment when it comes to domestic violence. Fantastic. Um, another question here is whether you've got any advice for refuting allegations by the perpetrator against the victim in DV and family court matters. So aside from the obvious um, uh, of protect, uh, sorry, of providing opposing evidence. So if there's no evidence, how can you refute, I guess, in uh, cross applications? Well, look, the cross application, I mean, the legislation itself as it currently stands says that where a cross application is made, then the court should actually endeavour who, you know, determining who's most in need of protection. So what, uh, what I think that asks us to do is to actually look at any evidence that we have of things like course of conduct, the impact of that, uh, that conduct, conduct, and some of the things that I've talked about today in this seminar essentially what will need to happen is evidence of coercive control, domestic violence um, needs to be put before the court. And I think real evidence on uh, about the impact of behaviours needs to be put before the court. Um, and I think that it's going to be taken more seriously once it's criminalised here in this state. Mm -hmm. Another question that's I think too often, sorry, sorry, I think too often, and this, I mean, and I see this all the time, um, police get to, uh, called out for an incident, they come out to the incident, they see two people who are upset, 
One of those people happens to be someone who's really, really distressed, might be hysterical, might be, um, might have had um, alcohol, um, and the other person is actually really uh, calm and has a scratch on their face. So the police go up to him and talk to him. They get a narrative, they get a version of what's happened. And in that version of what's happened, he says things like, she attacked me, she threw a plate at me, she scratched me. And then the police go, well, she's obviously the one who's the respondent and he's in need of protection. At best, they both need orders, right? So they'll either leave that scene with him needing protection and her being the respondent or they both need cross orders. Well, if you're actually acting for the person who's the respondent or there's a cross order and you talk to that client and that client says, "I, um, this is what's happening at home. This is the history. This is the course of conduct. This is the behaviour that I live with. He doesn't hit me. You know, he doesn't hit me. But he takes the keys as soon as, you know, he doesn't let me have car keys. He checks the bank balances. He abuses me if I actually spend more than $150 on groceries. You know, all of those questions that I've actually encouraged people to ask. And you go, oh my goodness, this is actually the person most in need of protection. You put that in your affidavit. You make those submissions. Sorry, is there any more questions? Uh, yes, there's just one more that's come through. Um, so that one I think would be a nice one to finish on as well, which is um, how can we best support women who might be or clients who are experiencing coercive control? Well, what, what our research showed was um, planting the seed, so actually have that material around. So that they can actually start almost identifying it themselves. If they can identify it themselves and they make that disclosure to you, then I'd be talking about safety planning and I'd be talking about when and if they're ready to maybe, you know, leave, take out a domestic violence order until they're ready to start collecting evidence. Um, and then making sure that the way that they get that evidence is safe. So one of the really key features of coercive control is um, really high levels of monitoring and surveillance. So I'd be making very, very sure that when you're talking about those strategies, you're really making it very clear to your client that they have to actually be safe. So safety planning, collecting evidence, and then when they're ready, uh, if they're ready to leave, when they're ready to leave, actually supporting the client, making that application for domestic violence, providing warm referrals. So it's always about not going here, here's DV Connect, here's Respect Australia, here's just ring one of them and see what, you know, actually ring the service and say, I'm referring blah, blah to you to do safety planning. Because what we found in our research was warm referrals work rather than general, here's a pamphlet of the, the five top services in our area. Um, advocating for your client when it comes to, you know, the, the domestic violence applications to family law proceedings. Um, but the really key take home message for us was planting the seed. So that's why Women's Legal Service, the two Women's Legal Services, North Queensland and we, are providing all of the people who have who've registered to this seminar the resources, which is that that hopefully that poster that you can put up in your foyer, and that fact sheet for or um, for staff to look at and actually get some ideas for when you are working with your clients who might be experiencing coercive control. That's the whole reason why. You know, it's got some sample questions. It's got some things for you to keep your eye on. Great. Now, we are at time, um, but Julie has uh, agreed to stay on for just a smidge longer. Um, one more question has just come through, Julie, if you're happy to respond to it, because I think it, it could be a, a helpful one as well. 
Um, so mm -hmm. if uh, your client has been misidentified as a perpetrator of violence and the cross application is unsuccessful through no fault of your own or, uh, mm -hmm. or that of the duty lawyer, what is the legal recourse? Uh, well, you could, um, uh, well, if, uh, so, so, so you're in a situation where um, somebody has, has taken out a domestic violence order, your client has actually been misidentified. So you then say, okay, well, I'm going to ask for at least a cross order and that's unsuccessful. Then the best that you can do is actually oppose the order being made against your client. That is very important because legal systems abuse is a very common feature of coercive control. So it is so important for you to actually support your client as best you can to defend the actual order that's being taken against them. Because clients who are experiencing coercive control will often be misidentified and they will often be likely to just, you know, I'll just consent without admissions. What the harm, what's the harm? What's the harm is they will be provoked into, you know, coming over, contacting the, the aggrieved, a whole range of things, and then being breached. And then if there are family court orders later on, those breaches in that domestic violence order is going to be used to great effect against them. So I think firstly, make sure that you actually support your clients, provide them with all of the information you possibly can to actually defend that domestic violence order and then make it really clear that even though it might feel safer for them to actually just consent without admissions because you know that's the nature of coercive control. It really undermines a person's sense of autonomy and safety and feeling like they can trust their own mind, really. I would suggest you actually really support your clients to defend the application. Okay, wonderful. So we might uh, wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Julie, uh, for your time and expertise today and for sharing that really important information about coercive control and some practical uh, tips for uh, community lawyers and others who might be advising or assisting clients in this area. Um, as I mentioned, there will be a recording of today's session. I will uh, get that out to everyone as soon as possible uh, so that you can watch it, share it with your colleagues, um, and for those who weren't able to attend the live session, for them to watch it as well. Um, before I do close the session down today, please make sure you complete the feedback survey that will pop up on the screen automatically after the session is finished. Um, that really assists us in um, continually improving our webinar program and is really helpful feedback for our presenters as well. Um, hopefully we'll be able to present um, further sessions on coercive control as things unfold uh, later this year uh, with the hear her voice report and other uh, work that the Queensland government is doing in this area um, but for now uh, once again on behalf of everyone who's joined us today thank you so much Julie it's been a pleasure to host you and we'll uh, look forward to seeing everyone at our next CLCQ webinar bye for now thank you bye-bye